Welcome to those of you who are just joining us and welcome back to those who joined us yesterday or this morning. On behalf of all of the host organizations, I'd like to welcome you to our second U.S. Sustainable Wine Growing Summit. My name is Allison Jordan. I'm the Executive Director of the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. And I just wanted to start with a few reminders. Please use the Q&A button for questions and you could use the chat feature to converse with the panelists or and or with other attendees. And this session is really meant to be as tour-like as we could possibly make it under the circumstances. I suppose another silver lining is being able to go to four different states in an hour all across the country without ever getting on a plane. So during the videos, if for some reason the audio isn't working, as before, please use the link to watch later. And um, we'll also have it in the recording that we'll be sharing following the summit. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Cliff Omart, who is with Protected Harvest, formerly with Sure Harvest, and prior to that with the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. I know he's been an invaluable partner to the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance and to many of our partners from other states that have relied on Cliff's expertise. And over the course of the year, he literally wrote the book on sustainability, several in fact, um, and he helped develop powerful continuous improvement models and certification programs that will benefit the industry for years to come. So Cliff, over to you. Thank you very much, Allison, and welcome everybody. Sustainable farming is a broad, complex, and continuing to evolve approach to growing wine grapes. I think safe to say that the wine growers as a group were the first to embrace it, and in my opinion, have collectively made more progress than growers of any other crop in the US. There are various ways to look at the evolution of sustainable wine growing on a national level. There are individual wineries and growing operations that have been practicing and perfecting sustainable wine growing for a long time. Another way to look at it is to look at the grower groups that have addressed the topic and developed programs for their members. And these started in the early 1990s. Examples are the Lodi Wine Grape Commission, the Napa Valley Wine Growers, the Vineyard Team located in the Central Coast of California, the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, the New York Cooperative Extension Program out of Cornell and Long Island, Sonoma County Wine Grape Commission, and the Washington Wine Growers. The next step in the evolution of sustainable wine growing was the development of certification programs. Low Input Viticulture and Enology, or LIVE in Oregon, I believe, was the first in the US. Then that was followed by the Lodi Rules for Sustainable Wine Growing. Another example of certification programs are the Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing, Sustainability and Practice, again, home based in the Central Coast of California, Fish Friendly Farming, the Napa Green in the North Coast of California, and the statewide program, the California Certified Sustainable Wine Growing. One needs a sustainability vision and goals for the vineyard and winery to guide one's long-term processes. However, this vision and its goals are achieved by implementing individual practices. Common to all regions are viticulture topic areas like vineyard location and site prep, choosing the appropriate varieties and if necessary, the appropriate rootstocks to match the climate, soil type, and the goals of the winery that is making the wine, appropriate vine spacing and trellis systems, canopy management, soil health management, irrigation and nutrition management, and pest management. And true to the evolving sustainable area, new areas of emphasis are employee management, neighbors and community relations, energy management, and carbon footprint of production. How these are addressed sustainably can be vary quite a bit from region to region. Important drivers for what sustainable practices are possible to implement by an individual grower are great prices, price point of the wine that it's going to be made from, and local cost of production. This can vary widely from region to region, even within a state. I would say California would have the widest range with great prices varying from $300 a ton to more than $6,000 a ton, and the cost for production is varying in the same order of magnitude. For many reasons, some of which I've mentioned, the level of implementation of sustainable practices varies from grower to grower. I like to think of implementation of farming practices as being on a continuum, from less sustainable on one hand 
two of the most sustainable on the other. The population of wine growers in the US are distributed all along this continuum. I feel no matter where one is on this continuum, it is important that we strive to move toward a higher level of sustainability along this continuum, continually improving over time. While there is no time to discuss all of what I've mentioned, the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance has invited four individuals to highlight some of the things that their respective companies are doing to address sustainability. They are from Washington, Oregon, New York, and California. Our first up is Kelly Gregory, who comes to us from Adelsheim Winery in Newborough, Oregon. She's the vineyard manager there. And Willamette Valley continues to gain traction for the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay wines that they are making. Kelly, let's uh, view your video first. Hi there, I'm Kelly Gregory, the vineyard manager at Adelsheim Vineyard. We've been growing wine grapes here in the Willamette Valley for quite some time. Uh, we're actually celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, so very exciting for us. Currently, we're growing about 175 acres of primarily Pinot Noir and Chardonnay across six different uh, beautiful estate sites. Adelsheim's always been focused on sustainability. We've um, been live certified kind of since the beginning. So we're actually one of the first wineries to be live certified. And our vineyards have been live and salmon safe certified since 2008. So what is LIVE, you ask? I'm gonna tell you. LIVE stands for Low Input Viticulture and Enology. It is a Pacific Northwest-based third-party certification that focuses on the sustainability practices for the whole farm and the whole winery. We prioritize cultural control practices for canopy management to reduce the need for external inputs. With vigorous canopies in Western Oregon, we incorporate IPM strategies to reduce our overall canopy size and density. Aggressive pruning, shoot thinning, Upright shoot positioning and fruit zone leaf removal are essential for disease control and for premium wine quality. When fungicides are needed, only approved chemicals are used. We implement extended spray intervals to lower the amount of chemical and water usage and to reduce the number of tractor passes being made. We do not rely on insecticides and do not utilize herbicides for weed control. My focus is on nutrient cycling to strike a balanced vineyard that is self-sustained. Our grapevine nutrition is mostly accomplished via flailing of the pruned wood, cover crop management, and compost from the winery and surrounding landscape. We removed 90% of last year's growth during the dormant pruning season, and rather than burning the wood, which would release carbon into the environment, we flail the prunings into mulch, which then recycles the carbon back into the soil. None of our vineyard floor is left uncovered during the rainy months in order to reduce soil erosion and water runoff. Our soils are protected with either perennial grass or an annual mix of nitrogen-fixing legumes and cereals. These cover crops act as a nutrient source for the grapevines. They increase soil organic matter and soil microbes and improve soil structure while helping to preserve soil moisture. Insects love them too. Another way I incorporate nutrients back into the system is by composting. We utilize all the winery pumice and leaves from crush, incorporate organic matter from winery landscaping, and add local manure into the mix. Our compost is being added in areas of low vine vigor, where I am working to boost soil organic matter and microbial activity. A big part of the LIVE program is centered around ecological compensation zones. 25% of our owned land is not planted to vineyard, but rather managed for wildlife habitat and biological diversity. We have bird boxes, beneficial insect habitats, and wildlife corridors. The forests have walking trails to improve worker health. We prioritize removing invasive plants and restoring native plant populations. We have a fruit, vegetable, and flower garden at our winery, and it is a pleasure to incorporate our locally grown goods into our guest experience and also to share those with staff. Our vineyards are mostly dry farmed, and when irrigation is required, the water that we use comes from the vineyard itself. For the most part, only young plantings are irrigated during the establishment phase, and then the vines can rely on the natural rainfall. As a company that has been stewards of this land for the last 50 years, we prioritize doing the right thing and taking this responsibility of farming very seriously. We are striving for the most natural expression of place in our wines, and that requires management strategies that are very different than today's conventional approach to farming. It's not always easy. It certainly is not cheap. And a lot of times it goes unnoticed, but we believe the benefit to the land, the health of the people, and the quality of the wines far outweigh the challenges that come with sustainable farming. I've really only begun to scratch the surface. And there's a whole lot of things that we're doing in the winery that I haven't even mentioned, and a lot more in the vineyard. 
I hope this has been helpful and helped you guys kind of understand a little bit more about what Oregon's doing and what Adelsheim as a company is doing to increase our sustainability efforts. So thank you guys. That's great. Kelly, let's see if we can get through some of the questions for you. The first one is, is the Willamette Valley experiencing any changes in overall season conditions? And if so, what are they and how is the region responding to them? Yeah, good question. Um, absolutely, we are. We there. I would say the last kind of seven to eight years, it's we're just referring to it as the new normal. Um, we're seeing kind of our seasons just shifting forward by about two to three weeks. So bud break is happening beginning of April instead of the third or, or last week of April. Um, and we're seeing rainfall amounts really kind of changing. So coming into the spring drier than we historically have been. Um, traditionally, Oregon is pretty dry throughout the summer, but we're coming into the growing season with less uh, rainfall throughout the winter months. And we're seeing harvest kind of approach you know, quickly. So ripening is getting compressed and harvest is kind of creeping up maybe in sometimes a month earlier than what we've seen. And so people are definitely responding as development goes in. We're seeing um, people planting higher elevation. Uh, I would say 15, 20 years ago, 600, 700 feet was kind of the max. And people are looking for places to plant a thousand feet in elevation. Um, people are planting on northern facing slopes. Um, and we're doing, we have three different trials we're doing on our different soil types. And we're basically looking to see what, what rootstocks are going to be um, best for us in the future. What is, what's most resilient as far as its nutrient and water needs um, and what, what can respond to these kind of environmental conditions that are definitely changing. Um, and just kind of laying out, people are laying out vineyards differently, different spacing, different uh, clones. People are planting different varieties than they, than they have in the past and definitely an emphasis on um, making sure people have access to water before they um, make a commitment to purchasing land. Well, connected to this, what uh, is unique about the climate in Newburgh and how does that influence your sustainable practices uh, that you're doing at Adelsheim? Yeah, so um, we get a lot of fall in the winter months. So more so than, than Washington and California, um, and unlike New York, we're not really getting those summer rainfalls. So we're kind of, with the four states, we're kind of in a unique, um, it comes down to water essentially. And so we struggle in the springtime when a lot of the, you know, the vines are waking up, it's really busy time for us in the vineyard. We're, it's time to spray, it's time to do um, groundwork. And we, a lot of times our soil is too wet to do that. And so that's, that's one of the challenges that we have kind of from a logistics standpoint that comes from the weather. Um, but what happens is because we have the, this really rich soil and we have plenty of uh, rainfall throughout the winter months, we grow these really big canopies. Um, so our canopies in, in Western Oregon are really big and that's, I would say a lot of our sustainability practices are focused around that um, through cultural control of the canopy so that we can try to reduce um, the need for fungicides and reduce the water need of the plants. So we don't have to irrigate as much. So a lot of uh, hand labor on canopy manipulation, lots of shoot thinning, leaf removal, anything we can to kind of just shrink the canopy so that it doesn't need more inputs to get us through the season. And I believe you mentioned that you are switching to non-herbicide weed management. So that's pretty impressive. And what are the challenges that you faced in that switchover? Yeah, so we've been, um, we just kind of went 100% ripped the bandaid off. I know people that are kind of going at it in phases and you know one step is it's in the right direction so to each their own but we just kind of went all in um and there was definitely a learning curve so we haven't been spraying herbicides since the 2016 was the last season um we were using herbicides in our vineyards and the first year there's kind of a carryover a residual impact in the soil so you're kind of like oh this isn't so bad and by the second or third year you're like wow there's a lot of weeds um the biggest thing for us is just Learning, there's a, a workflow that changes very much when you're when you're no longer spraying herbicides before the canopy even opens up to now all of a sudden you're trying to come in with equipment and do mechanical weed cultivation at the same time when your soil is ready to be worked, the grass needs mowed, the vines need sprayed. And so it's just is a lot of um it's it's more work. And 
the cost is absolutely um, one of the most glaring things. Switching to non-herbicide vineyard management has driven up costs, not even just from just the, the fact that you have to purchase the equipment and then drive the, the machinery, but it's things like um, vines get damaged and you have to replant them to having to raise, um, kind of retrofit the trellis to make sure that this equipment can come through without making damage um, that needs to be repaired. And so I would say that we've kind of figured out the, um, we figured out the logistics of farming and timing everything perfectly. And we have the skilled operators to make it work. And we're kind of over the sticker shock of what it costs. But I would say those are the two kind of biggest things. And then this season is very di difficult because like last year we had late season rain. And so we had already come through managed for the weeds and then they kind of got regerminated again. And so it's just every year is different with it, but um, it's it's definitely paying off and it has its challenges, but we're we're going for it, we're, we're committed. Great, well, I think that is all we have time for. Kelly, thank you so much. Of course. We are now uh, by the grace of Zoom, jumping all the way across <laughs> the US to Eric Anderson, who works at RGNY Winery. Uh, Eric got a start in viticulture working at the University of Missouri Viticulture Research Program in 2008, where he oversaw experiments and data collection, primarily looking at hybrids. Then in three years uh, later, he moved to Mattituck, New York on Long Island, where he was a vineyard manager at McCurry Vineyards. And there he grew mainly vinifera. And then it was back to Missouri in 2016, where he worked at a small winery outside Kansas City, again, back with hybrids. And now he's back in Long Island working at RNGNY, which is uh, a Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing Certification member. Uh, also, their uh, company uses the Vine Balance Workbook to help guide their sustainability program. And Eric, I understand your video is going to feature your uh, recirculating sprayer, but before we play the video, could you just tell us a little bit about what some of the practices are, sustainable practices you use to make sure that you minimize your spraying for both disease and insect pests? Um, yeah, so we do a lot of scouting just to make sure that when we're going out to spray, um, it's the right time to spray. Um, and we do as much canopy management as we have or as we can so we can reduce as much spraying as possible, including uh, leaf removal and um, uh, suckering and uh, shoot thinning and stuff like that. So um, basically we try to extend our uh, spray, uh, our sprays out as much as possible so that we don't have to spray as, uh, as often as we can. And uh, these recovery sprayers allow us to do two full rows at a time, which reduces our carbon footprint. Um, as much as possible. So here's the video. <laughs> so this is our recovery sprayer. Uh, it recycles everything that oversprays through the canopy um, and there's zero drift. Uh, it also enables you to spray on days where the wind might not be ideal. Um, it also sprays two complete rows at a time. So these are the spray nozzles. They spray into each other and get recycled into these curtains and down through these grates where it's filtered, put back in the tank, and then comes back through so you have absolutely no waste. Uh, we usually close these to about here. Um, a little bit of drift comes out, but it's not enough to really go anywhere or anything like that, and you're literally saving 95% of everything that you spray. So here on Long Island, the weather can be really unpredictable. Um, that's one of the reasons this sprayer is so beneficial to us because we can spray two complete rows at one time, which basically enables us to spray the vineyard in half the amount of time that we would with a regular air blast sprayer. Um, and we can also spray in less than optimal conditions when it's a little bit windy or something like that. Great, Eric. Um, the first question I want to ask you is um, you've had the fortune to both work in Missouri and Long Island. Uh, so what would you say are the issues that pose the most challenges of sustainable farming in both places? Um, well, in Missouri, the soil, I actually, the last place that I worked at, we tried to do as much 
under the row, uh, like mechanical under the row weed management as possible, but the soil is so heavy and thick there uh, that that was a, a real big issue. And then the humidity in general, um, it kind of balances out because you're primarily dealing with hybrids there, which require less spraying. Um, but uh, it's really, you know, it's the soil type is the biggest difference between the Midwest and, and being out here on Long Island. Uh, the thing in common is that we get rain pretty much throughout the season. Um, there is no, you know, spring rain and, and fall rain. It just kind of comes throughout the season. Some years are worse than others. So uh, at everywhere that I've worked so far, which I'll just say I started here in December. So I haven't even really gotten through a whole season with RGNY yet, but, um, but I've always tried to uh, implement some sort of mechanical weed management. And here on Long Island, it's just been uh, really difficult to, you can get started through the season and try to uh, you know, control everything as much as you can. But once the rain starts coming and you can't get through the vineyard with a tractor and the weeds really start to take off, uh, that's, that's one of the biggest, you know, uh, roadblocks to being completely sustainable that way, uh, as we can. So. And before we get too far away from the recirculating sprayer, do any, does anyone in Missouri use that type of sprayer? Uh, some people do. The problem with, uh, Missouri is that it's a lot of the vineyards are on hills. And the way that those curtains are set up, you just, you're dragging along one side of the canopy if you're not um, dragging on the other. So that's the main thing. But I know that there are some people that use them and um, they're, they're just a double whammy as far as, you know, saving you money as, uh, along with, uh, you know, reducing drift and, and making it a more efficient run through the vineyard. Great. Um, so what practices, again, thinking of Missouri and Long Island, what practices are you usually most excited to talk about with uh, other growers, uh, visitors to the wineries or vineyards, or any meetings that you go to? Um, well, one of the things that I've always tried to do in both places is, is balance our vines and, you know, only expect the crop level that we, uh, that we can get based on the, the vine size so that we're not, you know, trying to always push more chemical nitrogen or, or fertilize in a way that um, is pushing the vines, you know, beyond what they can do. Uh, so composting, that's obviously a big one um, in that way, you know, raising the organic matter uh, so that there's more of a long-term solution than, um, than using chemical fertilizers and, and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, a, a big one everywhere that I've worked has been having some kind of uh, natural rehabilitation of native species somewhere on the vineyard, whether it be wildflower, wildflowers or, uh, or you know, just an area dedicated to, uh, you know, letting, you know, small animals like rabbits and, and groundhogs and stuff like that kind of do their thing. So um, it's kind of just the the overall implementation of like uh, the vineyard is a living area that we want to, you know, keep as, as natural as possible. And uh, another question would be, what are some of the practices that are unique to, and this would be in Long Island in particular, that you would say unique to Long Island versus any other area? Um, well, uh, primarily it's, it's the trying to control the weeds without using too much herbicide because we have, uh, such a high water table here and trying to limit, um, whatever herbicide we can, uh, because there's a, a strong concern about, I guess, polluting the, the aquifer that people drink from out here on the East End of Long Island, especially. Um, and for the most part, that's a, you know, a misconception, whereas because vineyards don't really have too much, you know, leaching potential and, and stuff like that. But we live in an area where there's been a lot of potato farming and uh, sod farming and stuff like that over the years. And so we, we're, we're working hard not to get lumped in with, um, with everything else that's 
that's been farmed out here over the years. And it's been a long time since I've been there, but I remember when I visited in Long Island, they were doing, they had water monitoring, monitoring wells. I don't know if yeah, it was sure. local or state. Is that still going on? Uh, yes, it is. I think on our farm, we have uh, two or three and you'll see the, the, the state or the county. I'm not sure they'll come out at different times of the year and monitor everything. Um, and so we try to just, you know, work with them as much as possible. Like I said, it's mostly a perception thing because farming is farming to a lot of people. And it's, you know, if you're spraying, you're spraying and they don't really differentiate. So um, it's good to have a good working relationship with them. And do you think it helps uh, with RGNY being a part of the Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing Program? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And um, and before we were RGNY, we were Martha Clara, which was one of the uh, one of the founding members of the Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing Program out here. And um, yeah, yeah, no, I know that it does for sure. Great. Well, that that's it for our brief time in on Long Island. Eric, thank you very much. Now we're going to be jumping all the way back across the U.S. Uh, to where we're going to be talking to Nikki Wente, who is the viticulture manager at Wente Vineyards in California. She is a fifth generation wine grower who followed in her father's footsteps, uh, where she's pursuing viticulture management on the family uh, estate near Livermore. She's now the senior vineyard and viticulture manager there. Uh, one of the unique things about Wente is it's both the certified winery as well as certified vineyard operation. So I think first, Nikki, I believe we will watch your video first. A big part of sustainability for us in California specifically, but I think around the world as well, is water conservation. So we know it's such a precious resource. So here at Wenti, we use a number of different technologies to help us conserve water while irrigating our vineyards the proper amount to produce high quality grapes. So this year we actually tried something new. Um, we decided to graze sheep in a couple of our vineyards. Um, it has been a big ticket thing around, I think, the entire industry. So we really wanted to, to try it out. Um, it is chewing down a lot of the cover crop that we have growing. However, it does eliminate multiple passes. So it'll eliminate any herbicide pass that you might need to do. And it also eliminates um, mowing pass. So you're going through the, the vineyard less and less, which is good for emissions. And you're also compacting your soil less. So the more you're running uh, heavy equipment through your vineyard, the more your soil is being compacted, which overall is damaging to soil health. Now in this block of Semyon, we actually did every other row, native grasses and um, then seeded cover crop here. So you can see the, the beautiful flowers that are actually helping to improve our soil structure. They help with nematodes in the soil, a lot of different things. So kind of fun to be able to see the differences between the native grasses and these thriving floral cover crops here. <laughs> here is our compost farm. <laughs> so we have all of our pumice from the previous year harvest coming out here. We also have local ranchers that come and bring composted man manure to mix in with the pumice. Um, so all the grape skin, seeds, stems, you can even see some rachis here. Um, and we cook it all year long and then apply it in the fall. So we have quite a bit of compost to get on this year. In this block of Chardonnay, you can see the homemade compost that we spread uh, underneath the vines in the fall. Um, that helps to build up carbon in the soil. And then we also have our native cover crop here that we allow to grow up, a lot of native grasses that um, are carbon fixing. And we run a no-till system. So when the grasses start to dry a little bit more, maybe a couple more weeks, late April, early May, we'll come through and we'll mow uh, mow the grass down to, for fire prevention, but we want to make sure that we're retaining as much carbon in the soil as possible. That's a great, Nikki. Uh, 
I have a question I've been looking forward to asking you, and uh, I heard the rumor that you, you, Wente was looking at the electric Monarch tractor. So is there something you can tell us about your experiences with the Monarch tractor if you have them? Yeah, so we don't have them quite yet, but we are purchasing two Monarch tractors. Um, we will be uh, receiving them between now and May 14th. So we might receive the first one on Thursday. They're just trying to make sure that all of the technology behind it is also uh, completed. So they're finishing with updates um, because this is like a smart tractor. It's not just the, your regular tractor that's electric. It's an electric tractor that's also smart, has tons of cameras. So we're super excited about it because um, I truly do think that the future is electric um, or renewable energy of some sort. And I think that autonomy is also something that's gonna be farming for the future, farming for sustainability, um, to be able to have one operator running multiple pieces of equipment rather than just the one that he can sit on. And I don't know if you're able to do this, but can you give us any idea about the power specs on it and that kind of thing, what kind of equipment it can run? Um, yeah, so we've actually tested it with a lot of our different equipment. It can do all of our mowers. It can uh, tow a three-ton gondola, so a, a grape gondola that you would machine harvest into, holding three tons. Um, it can pretty much do anything that uh, a normal, you know, 90 horsepower tractor could do. Um, so we're really excited about the Monarch tractor. The battery life is between six and eight hours, depending on how much power you're using. Um, so something that's gonna use a little bit more energy is probably like a, let's say a, a sulfur dusting fungicide uh, aero fan might use a little bit more energy. So you might be at that six hour mark, but you can always get, re re uh, excuse me, um, replaceable or a spare battery that you can exchange midday um, to make sure you can continue the operation, uh, even if it's running something a little bit heavier power draining. That's that's fascinating. So you did, I get it right, you, you actually are purchasing two? Yes, we are purchasing two um, with, in partnership with the Bay Area Air Quality District. Okay, um, so, so you, they were, you've made the jump. We've made the jump. Uh, we're very excited. We um, first partnered with Monarch back in, I think, 2019 now, when they asked if they could run some trials on our vineyard because we were a lot closer to their facility um, than Napa, Sonoma, where some of the other trial vineyards they were going to were in. So um, coming to Livermore was quicker. So we have been working with them ever since, and we really believe in their mission and are excited to, to continue forward with the tractors when we receive them. That's great. Uh, sort of stepping back a bit, what trends do you personally see and does Wente see for the future of sustainable practices? What any trends that you're seeing? Yeah, and, and as I mentioned, I, I really think autonomous uh, vineyard equipment is going to be something super huge for sustainability. And that's when I think of sustainability, I think of it full faceted. You know, I think of the environment, but I think of the people, I think of your neighbors, I think of um, pretty much any your business efficacy, like how are you performing? Um, and so if I don't want to, I want my employees to be able to be doing more with less. I want them to be able to achieve the job and I want it to be easy for them. It's not that we're trying to get rid of employees. It's that we want them to be using their brain in a way that is better for them and better for us. And if they're just sitting in a tractor all day, I don't know how much they're actually, there's a lot of things that I could be having them help me with that they can't do while they're there. So we're super excited about the potential for autonomous uh, vineyard equipment. But I think that um, there's going to be a lot of technology involved in the vineyard from, you know, spray recycling, like we just saw uh, with Eric. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot with water, how we can try and continue to clean water to a point that we can put it onto the vineyard um, and not be scared of any sort of leaching effect into the groundwater source. Um, so reuse of water, you know, reverse osmosis. I think there's a lot to, to be said there. I think also renewable energy and just trying to figure out how to get power to a lot of different places that might need power for autonomous infrastructure like water uh, valves or um, tractors or a lot of different things to just make smart smart vineyards. 
sort of like smart warehouses are becoming. I think they'll, there'll be smart vineyards as well. And I noticed in your video at the beginning, you had a, a little solar panel with a Thule uh, box there. Uh, for those that may not be aware of Thule yet, it's a relatively new company. Do you want to say anything about what that was and what you're doing with it? Yeah, so Thule measures evapotranspiration, so all the water coming out of the leaves uh, in, the, in the plant, and it also measures every time you turn on your irrigation system. So we're trying to track how much water our vines are actually using so that we can precision irrigate to save, conserve water. We really find Thule super effective. Um, we've seen the results in the timing and amount volume of water that we're putting on based on their recommendations. Uh, our vineyards are healthier, happier, and we're using less water. So we're super excited about that technology. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to see more people using that. It just seems like a great system. I don't have any direct relation. The only connection I have is the head of the company, Tom Shaplin. He was an intern for me in Lodi for a summer. It was, he's a, a really interesting, great guy. So I'm glad to see that happening with Wenti. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, awesome. uh, another quick question. Any other sustainable practices you've been experimenting with before we jump to Washington State? Yeah, so we have been experimenting with um, sheep. We've been experimenting with how to reduce any herbicide passes as well. So whether it's underground mowing or using a weed knife. Um, so we have those kinds of trials going. Um, and then in the winery, we've definitely been focusing on how to reduce waste, how to conserve water, recycle water, and also how um, to reduce the amount of energy we're using. So we got rid of our cold storage room completely, and now we're using a machine called the STARS machine that basically takes care of all cold stabilization and filtration um, on the way to going into the bottle and has reduced our energy quite significantly. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Nikki. It was really great to hear from you. And now for our last brief jump, we will jump up to Washington State from Livermore. And we are joined by Dick Boucher. He's owner and viticulturist at Boucher Vineyards. He planted his first grapes in 1980 in the Yakima Valley and is still farming those blocks. So he knows them well. He currently owns about 300 acres of grapes with 23 varieties growing in them and sells to 50 wineries in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. He also manages vineyards in the Red Mountain AVA for 10 different wineries. He's chairperson of the Washington Wine Commission Research Committee and has been involved in sustainable wine growing practices for over 25 years, a very busy fellow. Uh, first, Dick, let's uh, view your video. Sure. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Dick Boucher. Welcome to my home in the Yakima Valley, Grandview, Washington. And today I'm gonna, we're gonna have a brief uh, discussion about how I approach sustainability. And I, I kind of look at it as, as building relationships. And, and today I'm gonna talk about building relationships with my wineries. I sell to 50 different wineries, building relationships with my employees. I have about 50 employees. And of course, building relationship with my vineyard. And uh, I'm going to talk about how I'm trying to nurture all those briefly today. So let's go out the vineyard. Okay, in, in this vineyard right here, one thing we're doing is transitioning away or weaning away from herbicides. And um, it's not easy and it's very expensive, but one way we're dealing with it, we did purchase this cultivating machine and we're going to show it to you here shortly. And it's, it's, it's sort of an answer. I, I like the results. It's not as pretty, um, but we also find it has another benefit. We're also transitioning away from synthetic fertilizers. We've been using a lot of compost and this machine seems to um, mix the compost. It gets it better into the soil. And this particular machine, it uh, cultivates on both sides. We can do kind of one row at one time, half of each row. And it's, uh, it's an ID David that's made in Italy. And uh, I purchased it last year. And it's not cheap. It's around $30,000. Um, but I think it's in the long run for me, it's going to be an answer. I, 
Uh, we're kind of in a transition period. We've finished pruning, we're in a tie, and we're waiting for bud break. One of the most important things on my farm, and it's going to be uh, a big part of any sustainable program that I'm involved with, is uh, the relationship I have with my workers. On our farm, we generally want people working year-round, and they want job security. And a lot of people have been with me for 15 years and more. and. Um, just like any relationship, you have to treat them with respect. You have to listen to them. You have to talk to them and to communicate what you want. There's training. Uh, and above all, they, they need to feel safe working at this farm. And um, you need to respect their culture, their language, and their families. And most of my workers are women. So we give lots of uh, latitude for them to take care of their kids and schooling you must also you need to pay them adequately and we try to pay above the prevailing wage this block i planted in 1980 and this is where i learned how to grow grapes it wasn't always pretty but um, i've had a crop here for 37 years in a row so it's 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 doing okay but i i, I guess i'm here today because i uh, i want to be able to be doing this for another 40 years Speaking of respect, I, I have to say before I leave, you really should have a lot of respect for the California Sustainable Wine Alliance, for SIP, for the Lodi Wine Commission, uh, and LIVE, because these programs are very credible, they're very detailed, and I, I, they've uh, really set the standard for these sustainable programs. Well, thanks for that video, Dick, and it's it's great to have you to talk to. Um, I'm, my first question for you is going to take advantage of your role on the research committee, and Washington is growing a lot of grapes, a lot of success there. Uh, what do you see as the sustainably focused research gaps uh, that that you and we need to fill as an industry? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> for long-term sustainability, and a lot of these gaps. Um, people have touched on previously, uh, both Nikki and Kelly and uh, Eric and uh, in, in the morning. Um, and, and you asked the question, uh, I think something we all have in common is climate change and how we're dealing with that. Um, and it's expressing itself in many ways, uh, not only fires and water shortage, but uh, it's changing life cycles of um, pests and diseases. And uh, so just the challenges of keeping up with that, you can't just stick to uh, the same true uh, cultural practice. You need to adapt and change constantly. And I think that's what uh, most of the good programs are doing in, in, in Washington state, especially we've been focusing on our research side to try to stay ahead of that. Um, and in some cases, we're doing it quite well, and others, we're not. Um, the weed management thing came up, and I think we all share this challenge. Uh, and we're doing, there's so many approaches coming. Uh, Nikki talked about the uh, autonomous remote control things. Um, gosh, there's lasers and microwaves, and we're burning them, and we're electrocuting them, and we got sheep and goats. And we're trying everything, but they're all very expensive. And, and I, I think collectively we have to deal with that better. And if, if you're a poor grower that has a noxious weed that moved into your vineyard, it's, it's really tough to get rid of and deal with uh, in a sustainable way. So I think that's a challenge, but um, others, you mentioned carbon footprint, and we've even looked at, oh, it's hard to measure and quantify, but, uh, after talking to a certain couple of researchers, really a good sustainable program addresses really carbon sequencing and um, uh, removing and storing carbon dioxide if it's a well-designed system, which most of these are. And so I, I think we're going in the right direction in that. Um, some other uh, challenges, which is, all of us have in different ways is managing this uh, vector control for uh, 
species and pests that carry um, diseases and uh, viruses. And in Washington, it's, it's kind of our number one target. Uh, we need to do better modeling, uh, uh, pest modeling. We're, we're looking at it from genetic trials, uh, barriers, more better pest modeling so we understand the full life cycle of our problem up here is mealybug, but we also are having some nematode problems that are carrying uh, some viruses. Um, gosh, um, mating disruption we're working with, which California is. Uh, then one that's not so scientific and technical, but they talked about it earlier, and maybe it was growers we're not supposed to talk about, it, but really educating people about what we are doing and what's working and how it compares with each other. We, we all have a common core, um, I think, approaches. We've just adapted it to our own environments. And, and really, these programs are very comprehensive and they address a lot of the concerns, but we don't communicate it well enough. Um, I don't know, I could go on, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think a big, just more research and that a lot of it, our, our Washington program is sort of emerging, you know, Cornell's the model, UC Davis, Cal Poly, and it's really working collectively together on these. And that's, what we do in Washington when they can work with another university, uh, research university, and we, we really try to find the money to fund it because I think there's a synergy there uh, on, on certain areas. Um, and, and, and there's a, we're working, each state is working, they're spending more money and it's generated by the industry there's a little bit of federal and state money involved, but I'm always impressed at how the industry has stepped up to fund these programs. Um, and that's on top of individual growers funding their own programs. And there is an added expense. Um, at the same time, you have an expense, but there's a benefit. Um, since we started our, uh, this wine advisory program, we probably save 50% on water usage. And yet we're not, we're saving water, but we're doing it because it raised better grapes. We're watering at the proper time and the proper amounts. And um, so I think there's a, yes, we can save resources, but we can also do better job of farming. Uh, same thing, we're doing a lot of modeling for disease control. We calculated, we eliminate one mildew spray in our state and it's about a $6 million savings. And uh, so it's not only are you being less impactful on the environment, but you're saving some money. So it, yes, it costs money, but I think it's gonna keep us farming longer. Great, well, looking at the clock, I think uh, I wanna bring all of the panelists back and I think Allison Jordan is gonna jump in to um, what would be great if we have some questions from the audience. And I wanna compliment uh, all of the panelists. We finished right when we should have. We've got at least 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So Allison, do you have any you can throw at the panelists yet? Sure, and in fact, there's at least one question for each panelist, so maybe I'll just run through those. Yeah, great. Um, and great. if anyone wants to jump in and add any color, please do. Um, for Kelly, or again, anyone, how does switching from herbicides to tillage affect the carbon cycling? Do you think it's carbon neutral? Does it sequester carbon or does it add carbon? That's a good question because we're having, you know, we're having to get on the tractor more so we're doing additional tractor passes um i think you know if cliff would ask me about one of the what what is one of the gaps that we have as an industry i think there's a lot of missing information on sustainability and the, the efforts that we're doing and there's there's really there, we don't really have good information on the return on our investment or the impact that it's having on the um, improvements to the environment or we think improvements to the environment or the people. And so we're, we're kind of doing these because we feel like it's the right thing to do and we're, we're committed and morally that's how we feel like we should be managing our land. Um, but those types of questions are really hard to accurately answer, unfortunately. 
topic area that's an area in need of more research. Um, okay, anybody else want to comment on that? If not, I'll jump to a question for Eric. So Eric, I think you gained some interest in the recirculating sprayer that you described. Um, could you give us a sense of a range even of how much it costs? Um, I, I'm pretty sure, I, yeah, I haven't been involved in purchasing one in probably five or six or seven years, but okay. uh, I think they're around $30,000, 30 to $40,000 to get set up with one. One thing is you can take an existing air blast sprayer, like a turbo mist or something like that, and buy the curtains. I don't know if you can buy the whole kit, but an existing sprayer can be retrofitted to, to put those curtains on. Um, it's just a frame and hydraulics and uh, the whole thing. I think you buy it from Lipco or there's a, a company called Red Track that, that makes them that's in uh, Canada, I think. Got it, thank you. Okay, so Nikki, there was a lot of interest in your conversation about the cover crops and the sheep. And um, so one of the questions was, what are the advantages to planting cover crops every other row versus native resident vegetation every other row? Um, so for us, it's disrupting the soil too much. So we're trying to do every other row as less soil disruption while when we're seeding the cover crop. Um, and we only put cover crop that's seeded in, in blocks that have specific problems. So like nematodes are a specific problem that we try to fix with the cover crop. Um, so we'll use cover crops that are good for blocks that have nematode issues, um, but, or that we need nitrogen fixing or that could use a little bit more organic matter in the soil. Um, so the, every other row is kind of just what we've decided on is how we feel comfortable with disrupting the soil, um, trying to keep the no-till system in place. And I think I saw another question about the no-till system. And I think our bigger problem is getting like a squirrel hole or you know gopher holes or mounds that cause end up causing tractor damage because your tractor hits a mound and then you know you break a bearing or um, an axle. So that's probably the biggest problem, but they don't generally impact our vineyard uh, unless your vineyard's really young. Uh, the root system is so deep and, and strong in, in most vineyards that we don't see a huge issue with bulls or um, gophers or squirrels. Great. And what about the sheep? Do you have them come in during the dormant season or all season? During dormant season, uh, we don't, they'll eat anything. <laughs> so we don't want them to eat the, the succulent growth. Um, but it's actually been really great. They got rid of pretty much everything that we had out in that vineyard. Um, so we're excited. We're going to do some soil compaction tests. This is our first year grazing with sheep. So we're going to do compaction tests on how they may have compacted the soil. Cause I know my dad was the first person to say the sheep are going to compact the soil worse than the tractors. And maybe not with over the road tractors because they're so large and have um, only the, the one wheel down the middle rather than like a John Deere, which is the two wheels that get really close to the vine. And um, so it, it all kind of depends, but regardless, the less tractors that you have in your vineyard, the better for a lot of different reasons. Great. And Dick, you did such a great job talking about how you um, care for your employees as part of your sustainability. One person asked if you also offer flexibility for childcare for male employees given that gender equity is also part of sustainability? Yeah, good question. Probably not as much, to be honest, but occasionally. But the focus isn't, you know, us, us poor guys aren't worthy most of We're all going through this inclusion and diversity training, and we need to treat everybody fairly and the same. And we're probably not doing that as well as we could. Um, and uh, I, I really wanted to make the point, um, most critical piece, and when you're going into sustainability or, or organic or any, you're creating this good work environment uh, as far as health-wise. And uh, that's why I wanted that video to show uh, that, I'm mechanizing a lot, but but I sold a lot of small wineries, so I can't jobs. I'm trying to eliminate that for sort of ergonomics and to keep these same people to get more done that are actually very trained and skilled people. 
Um, but see that stimulated a big long <laughs> answer by me. Uh, it's great. And I hope um, many of you will join us tomorrow where we'll be also talking about some of these issues, including climate resiliency and social equity as part of sustainability. So, and Cliff, I'm gonna let you ask your last question, <laughs> maybe since you've been the moderator of this panel. Well, actually it was a question that I think we all agreed was a good one. And that is um, to get the panelists idea of what would be hot button issues around sustainability in the next five years. And don't be bashful. I, I can answer. Um, I, I notice a lot of people in the media or consumers asking me questions about, and you, you can tell they're not really fully educated on why they're asking this, but they've just heard it in places and they're just curious to know. But there, it's a lot of things around, um, do you guys spray herbicide? Do you spray any chemicals at all? Um, do you, are you dry farmed? And then the, when you kind of get a little bit further down the spectrum of people who are more knowledgeable, they start asking about um, carbon. Carbon's a big one that's coming up, carbon sequestration. And um, we have a lot of people that are asking about like residuals in the wine at, from, from a health standpoint. Is this wine healthy for me? Is this wine healthier than this wine over here on the shelf? So that's, it seems like it's trending in kind of a, a health, health of um, the environment and health of the consumer. Yeah, I would go off of that and just say that in general with like people that consume wine that talk to me about the industry, it's, there's a lot of misinformation. I think there's a lot of like um, work to be done as far as making people understand what goes into growing grapes in general, let alone like what's sustainable even means. And um, yeah, just educating people on how I mean, it's it's a fact of life that some pesticides have to be used and how they work and how, you know, the vine does or does not take them up and how it ends up in the grapes and all that kind of stuff, because there's just a lot of, you know, out of hand um, dismissing of, of a lot of a lot of things that people don't understand. So. And to come from a different angle, I, I think that a lot of people think that vineyards or the farming part of the organization is the worst for the environment. But if you actually do like a greenhouse gas emission study of your, your operation, it turns out that it's a very small piece of the greater pie. And, you know, lightweight glass would change the world <laughs> if everyone just put their wine in lightweight glass. So I think that there's going to be um, a record, like people are going to start to recognize that it's not all farming that is actually causing um, higher emissions. It's a lot of other things and trying to be a smart business partner, how you pack your product, how everything um, kind of comes together as an entire business unit, not just the farming piece. And Dick, you get the final word. <laughs> well, um, Kelly started this. I, I think, you know, the perceptions are all over the map. Um, I've farmed organically on other crops and I currently do. And for me and my wine grape operation with the people I work with and my wineries, this sustainability is what really works for me, kind of answers everything uh, and, and, and I can address it. Yes, we can use synthetics, but um, at the end of the day, you, you wanna be safe and you wanna be able to uh, make a living doing this. Um, and I would never use anything in a sustainable program that did any harm to my, my crops or my people or uh, any wine. And, um, and it, it's a very complex ecological system going on in a vineyard and to management just takes a lot of science, but also it's, it's a lot of art and uh, creativity to deal with it. And I see more creativity in this field right now than I've ever seen. And uh, it's very positive, I think. Um, I don't know, that's all I got to say. Well, Allison, uh, you can close us up. I wanna thank everybody on my behalf. And Allison, uh, over to you. Cliff, I have to ask you the same question because I feel like you're really well suited to give us your sense of 
what you think we need to be tackling next? What do you see as the hot button issue? <laughs> you should have told me you were going to do that. Because <laughs> I haven't thought about it and I am supposed to be retired. You know, to be honest, the thing that's popped up in my head, given my experience working with Lodi, is the whole Roundup situation. This is, is it going to be a challenge. Um, you know, this, this, this idea, um, there are a lot of growers in California that make almost no money. And wheat management, as everybody's talked about, is very expensive. And to be honest, in terms of risk management, compared to other materials, Roundup is not an issue. But of course, now we can detect it in the wine. So I see that in the next five years for the grower that's trying to make money but doesn't make a lot. I think it's a, gonna be a challenge. And, and it's, I'm glad it's there. We need to deal with it because I think people have relied too much on Roundup. But that said, it is a tool. So I think for a lot of growers, at least in California, that's gonna be a challenge. And they're dealing with it now. You can talk to growers and they're trying to figure out what's life after Roundup. So. Well, Cliff, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our winery hosts for your hospitality. We wish we could have been visiting you in person, um, sharing your best practices, knowledge. I think the, a number of the topics that have come up as sort of hot button issues, again, we'll be tackling tomorrow. So please join us. I think there's such an important role for research, for outreach and extension, and of course, for partnership, which is why we're all here today with our um, California, New York, Oregon, and Washington partners. Again, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, please do, do go to sustainablewinegrowing.us to sign up for tomorrow. And we will be sharing a recording, get to any unanswered questions, and, and get that out to you as soon as possible after the summit. So thanks again. Have a wonderful evening.